Porsche's Taycan EV Super Saloon changes electric vehicle design as we know it. The way it looks, the way it drives, the way it brakes, the way it charges, everything has been reconsidered, redesigned and reimagined. The result is a standard setting battery powered model that's purely Porsche and very desirable indeed. And here, in the industry's most comprehensive and detailed test, we're going to find out why. What might the Porsche of full electric performance cars be like? In this Taycan, we have our answer. It's more powerful and faster than any other EV yet made, with a heart that's electric, but a soul that's very much that of a Porsche. Fully electric performance cars are all much the same, right? They all give you a great big heavy battery, a couple of electric motors, and enough pulling power to tear up the tarmac. Oh yes, and they all feel terrible the first time you throw one into a corner. For a long time now, Porsche has been mulling over how to deliver something better. Now, you might think that Porsche and electricity have about as much in common as fire and ice, and you'd be wrong. The history of Porsche actually began with electric drive. Company founder Ferdinand Porsche designed his first electric car, the Eger Lohne C2 Phaeton, back in 1898 then two years later followed up by creating the first electric wheel hub motor and then the world's first functional hybrid car productionized as the Lona Porsche Mixta. His reasons for preferring electrification sound as natural now as they did then. Porsche complaining that the air was ruthlessly spoiled by the large number of petrol engines in use. What he couldn't do was overcome the usual automotive electrical downsides heavy weight and short battery range. More than a hundred further years were to pass before his company could return to this area of development, driven to at the turn of the century by ever more stringent emissions laws. The Cayenne S hybrid of 2010 was the first of a series of petrol electric models that culminated in the 918 Spider supercar of 2013 uh, then in the 919 hybrid world endurance race car and then in 2015 finally in the Mission E all-electric concept model. The Mission E shocked the EV establishment with class-leading recharging times, astonishing electrified charging tech and the world's most slippery EV model shape. And it was closer to sales reality than most realised. Its production-ready counterpart, this model, the Taycan, launched in late 2019. This is, according to Porsche, the start of a new era. Yet at the same time, the company wants to reassure its traditional customers that it isn't about to stop making combustion engine models anytime soon. What it wants to do going forward is offer the kind of credible alternative to fossil fuel that EV development has previously failed to bring us. A car with heart, soul and real driving DNA yet also an EV that is almost as day-to-day -day usable as a fueled model, free of compromise in range and interior practicality. Is this that car? That's what I'm here to find out. So what might the Porsche of EVs be like? The sound of a Zuffenhausen flat six and a proper Porsche sports car is, after all, a completely integral part of its charm. And let's be clear about this. The brand sees this as every bit a sports car, just one with four doors that happens to be completely battery powered. As is obvious, when you press this big switch on the dash and silence reigns. The tiny silver gear selector takes a bit of getting used to as well, as does the fact that the gorgeous race-style three-spoke wheel lacks the usual Porsche paddle shifters. Lots that's different then, but one thing's predictable. With all the torque on offer here developed instantly, it's going to be very, very fast. A 
I've been doing this job for 35 years and I actually can't remember going quite as quick in a road car as that. Even the least powerful Taycan variant at launch, the 4S has 530 PS on tap and hits 62 miles an hour from rest in four seconds flat. But the models most will choose, the Turbo and the Turbo S version I'm trying here, both begin at an output starting point of 625 PS. Then build on it with an overboost function that supplies a few seconds of extra launch or overtaking acceleration. That increases output on the turbo version to 680 PS, which sees that car demolish the 62 mile an hour sprint in just 3.2 seconds en route to 161 miles an hour. With this Turbo S, there's potentially 761 PS and a stupendous 1,050 Newton meters of pulling power beneath your right foot. Enough to trim that sprint figure to just 2.8 seconds. Even if you've driven cars as quick as that before, take it from me, this one will feel faster because everything's there all at once, like switching on a light. Less like a sports car, more like some sort of extreme fairground ride. Or at least that's what it will feel like if you're brave enough to test Porsche's claim that this car will do at least 10 tire smoking launch control standing starts before the battery reaches a critical temperature. I think I'd be feeling quite queasy way before then. Ah yes, the battery. All this turbo talk might make you forget that the power source here has cells, not cylinders, and sits beneath you rather than beneath the low slung 911 star bonnet ahead. The lithium ion pack in question is of substantial size, of course. Nothing less would suffice in a six figure luxury sports saloon weighing over 2.3 tons. The base 4S variant has a 79.2 kilowatt hour pack, but almost all Taycan customers upgrade to the same 93 kilowatt hour size that's used in the two turbo spec models. That kind of battery size we've seen before. But the power supply system it's linked to is groundbreaking. The 800 volt setup in use here being twice as powerful as that normally found in electric vehicles and one that Porsche has been developing in its 919 hybrid world endurance championship racing cars since 2011. 800 volts. Sounds promising, doesn't it? Uh, perhaps potentially the EV equivalent of stratospheric brake horsepower output in a conventional sports car, or maybe something that dramatically extends the driving range. Actually, the 800 volt setup does neither of these things. It has virtually no impact on driving range, uh, which is a pity because even if you go for the larger 93 kWh battery in the lightest 4S variant, the distance you can go on a single charge is rather disappointingly WLTP rated in the 208 to 288 mile bracket, which is way off Tesla levels. And the only way this 800 volt system benefits performance is via the relatively inconsequential four kilogram weight saving it delivers thanks to the provision of lighter cabling. What this setup does do, as we'll explain in our cost of ownership section, is potentially charge the car's battery much faster, though only if you can find an extremely powerful 800 volt public charger, which isn't very likely the way our country's national charging infrastructure is just at present. So that's a slight disappointment, but the rather unique way this car has been engineered offers ample compensation. Let's cover off the basics and I'll try and describe it in a way that doesn't require a physics degree for full understanding. The battery pack powers two synchronous electric motors, one on each axle, hence the all-wheel drive capability, though at some point in the future a rear-driven variant may also be offered. Each motor is of the permanently excited sort, which sounds like a toddler with a sugar fetish, but actually describes the way that the rotors of each AC motor create a permanent magnetic field, which delivers more efficient, constant and denser power delivery, further aided by clever hairpin stator wiring. The front motor drives its axle through an open differential, while the motor at the rear, which is bigger in the two turbo spec models than it is in the 4S, drives through a torque vectoring E-differential linked to two-speed 
automatic transmission that mostly uses its higher ratio. Uh, the lower one's mainly reserved for those savage launch control starts. EVs normally produce so much torque that they tend to decimate transmission systems of this sort. But this one uses an epicyclic gear train and a dog clutch with a multi-plate oil bath unit to ease changes. And that seems to have done the trick. Still with me? This is clever stuff. All of it's been engineered to work with a veritable arsenal of Zuffenhausen engineering in an attempt to try and make a car with the lumbering curb weight of Porsche's Cayenne e-hybrid SUV handle something like a proper sports saloon should. We doubt whether any other brand could have managed this, but somehow Porsche has. None of the dynamic stuff in play here is anything we haven't seen before, torque vectoring, adaptive damping with three chamber air suspension and optionally rear wheel steering and PDCC electromechanical roll stabilization. But with Porsche's 4D chassis control setup coordinating it all like the conductor of an orchestra, the result through the turns is quite simply astonishing when you consider the amount of weight in play here. Obviously the car's naturally low centre of gravity helps, as does the brand's typically feel some steering. You turn in, it stops, it goes, then you simply put your foot down and instantly find yourself somewhere else. There are drive modes of course, normal for the everyday, range if you've an eye on depleting battery capacity, or sport, or if you've gone for the sport chrono pack, sport plus for when you're pushing on and various other features duplicate those you'll find in a Panamera, the air suspension system that lowers itself by 22 millimeters on the highway and in the two sport modes, the extending spoiler that activates in three stages of 55, 99 and 124 miles an hour, and the optional GPS based inner drive system that can predict road topography up to two miles ahead and adapt the car accordingly. That Panamera is the car a typical Taycan customer will be most likely to have otherwise bought. That model always promised the elusive mantra of 911 sports car style drive dynamics for the luxury limo segment, but has never quite delivered in this regard in the way this Taycan can. It's never stopped like this car either, though this EV has the advantage of being able to recoup up to 265 kilowatts of energy through its regenerative system, far more than any other electric vehicle, which means that 90% of deceleration can be done without the assistance of the friction brakes. The ride is brilliant too. Porsche always have been very good at delivering that with heavy cars on huge wheels, and so it is once more here. Even the priciest luxury EV crossovers can crash a little over low speed undulations, but this one simply doesn't. It doesn't if you're in the right drive mode anyway. Expect to cruise serenely over speed humps in Sport or Sport Plus and you'll get a rude awakening. Otherwise the damping benchmark for EVs has been set here. There are a few things I don't like, uh, the relatively restricted range of course, though unlike Tesla's I've tried, the car pretty much always delivers most of what it promises in this regard. Uh, I'm not sold on the electric sport sound feature that you have to have on this Turbo S, it's optional elsewhere in the range. It's okay to have when you're pressing on, but in normal driving it's simply booming and annoying. Fortunately you can turn it off. Even without this element in play, there's a more noticeable level of electric motor whir under acceleration, though this somehow seems appropriate and welcome because otherwise this car's astonishing speed would be even more disorienting than it already is. Anyway, an utterly silent Porsche would be a strange and potentially rather unappealing thing. The fact that unlike other EVs you can't very much vary the level of brake regeneration and engage in effectively single pedal driving is unusual too. Porsche disapproves of single pedal driving, though if you have and have engaged the inner drive system I mentioned earlier you'll find the car significantly slowing itself at various times based on predictive GPS data. All of which leaves us, well, where? The word Taycan, derived from two terms of Turkic origin, 
can roughly be translated as soul of a spirited young horse, something that's lively, impetuous, vigorous, emotive, adjectives which, rather to my surprise, describe this Porsche rather well. A proper sports car should make you feel things, not just desire, but a sense of exhilaration, of challenge, of driving achievement. You might have despaired of an EV, any EV, ever properly providing that, but this one does. So, a Porsche like no other before it, but very definitely a Porsche. All the key elements of Zuffenhausen brand design are there. The special topography of the bonnet and front wings, air intakes instead of a dominant radiator grille, the Mark's so-called fly line, falling roof line, and a strong shoulder at the rear. These are elements that characterize every Porsche, but have, says design chief Michael Mauer, been subtly evolved in this one. You might have been expecting it to be an SUV, Every other competing brand took that route in creating its first luxury full electric vehicle. Not only because crossovers are trendy, but because their high stance disguises the ungainly need to place the passenger compartment on top of a huge battery pack, which would look odd in, say, a large luxury sports saloon, which was what Porsche decided to create here. A car that, amongst EVs, is absolutely unique in its proportions. An emotionally charged performance sedan that sits just 1,380 millimetres high, yet is almost two metres wide. There's really nothing like it. Especially here at the front, where, relieved of the need to house a huge combustion engine, the bonnet slopes down at a flat angle between two highly pronounced wings, just like a 911. Yet the Taycan has its own identity too, and one that will characterise future Porsche EVs, with distinctive touches, like the way that traditional headlights have been done away with. Uh, what you get here is basically an air intake, with a four-point LED light source, 84 individually controlled LEDs in the case of these matrix units. More intakes are also needed to cool the enormous brakes, hence these slim apertures that extend downwards ahead of the front wings. And from the side, well, you can see elements of Panamera in the side window graphic and the downward slope of the roofline. But there, the similarities end. The Taycan being 76 millimeters shorter and adopting a leaner, more muscular look thanks to short overhangs front and rear and a swept back Porsche fly line in the silhouette, which makes the car look sporty even when it isn't moving. Sculpted panel recesses create an interplay of light and shadow, and specific design touches include these air outlets behind the front wheels and flat door handles that pop out electrically when required. The wheels are between 19 and 21 inches in size. We've got satin platinum finished 21 inch Mission E design rims here, derived from those on the original concept car of that name. The rear is rather unique too, not in terms of this full width light bar, that's now a feature of all modern Porsches, though that illuminated features embedded three dimensionally shaped glass letters are Taycan specific. More unique is this subtly louvered aerodynamic lower diffuser design, something else that you'll see in future Porsche EVs and a feature which incorporates this very low set number plate. Horizontally arranged lines and pronounced wing shoulders give a deep, wide sports car look. And as usual with a Porsche, there's a deployable rear spoiler which extends in three stages depending on speed. As usual, what's more important is what you can't see. The stiff, sophisticated aluminium-rich J1 platform this car shares with its VW Group cousin and closest market rival, Audi's e-tron GT. It all builds a sense of anticipation for what might lie inside. Let's take a look. Here again, classic Porsche design staples mix with modern technology. 
So thanks to this low seat and raised centre console, there's a real cockpit style feel that's refreshingly different from the raised SUV demeanour of obvious luxury EV rivals. And the instrument cluster is wider than the steering wheel in a manner reminiscent of the original 911. But of course, things have changed a bit since 1963. Take a closer look and you'll find that what lies behind the grippy three-spoke wheel is anything but retro, a 16.8 inch curved digital screen, one of up to four here at the front of the cabin. There's a lower 8.4 inch touchpad on the center console, just below a 10.9 inch central infotainment monitor, which can be optionally extended with a further supplementary display here for the front passenger. There's a lot to take in. All of this feels entirely appropriate to a cutting edge 21st century premium EV, but you can't help sometimes feeling that old fashioned knobs and buttons, particularly on this lower center display, would be easier and more intuitive to use on the move. The touch controls around the edge of this instrument screen uh, for the lights on the left and the suspension settings on the right also require a glance away from the road to operate, which is less than ideal at warp level turbo S speeds. There are other issues too. The steering wheel rim hides the instrument display's outer temperature and time readouts and also manages to obscure this curious knurled auto gear selector, apparently borrowed from the 918 Spider. Plus the big on off switch that you get on the right side of the wheel, which powers everything up and down. Looks like the sort of thing that you'd find on a Dyson product. Now, you're not offered any sort of handbrake button and there are no mechanically operated louvers for the air vents either. You have to activate them via this lower screen. Still, you adjust to all of this quite quickly and the instrument screen in particular has been well thought through, based, as you can see, around these three configurable round virtual dials. The central one will most commonly be used in uh, this digital speedo power meter setting, which is all you see if you set the display in its minimalistic reduced mode. Alternatively, you can view a map and extend it full screen if you wish, or access infrared night vision if you pay the extra for it. Using this right steering spoke button allows you to configure the outer two instrument screen circles. The left one can show assist systems, traffic signs you pass, G-force readings, your all-wheel drive status, the PDCC adaptive damping setup, and tire pressure info. Switch to the right hand circle and you'll probably most commonly want this information screen which can show remaining battery percentage and current charge. But you might alternatively prefer to see navigation instructions, trip data, your chosen drive mode setting or if fitted the sport chrono stopwatch, the readout for which as usual on a Porsche is duplicated by a prominent central analog dial perched on top of the dash. Anything this instrument binnacle display can't tell you, and much that it can, will be covered, of course, by this central 10.9 inch PCM Porsche communication management touchscreen display in the center of the dash. It isn't quite as good as the PCM setup of the current 911, because unlike in that model, you don't get a useful scrolling panel of shortcut buttons on the right hand edge of the screen. Rather counterintuitively, nav, media and phone shortcut haptic buttons for this upper screen have been repositioned to the top of the lower display below these twin central vents. If you'd rather not fish around for those, there is a voice activation system that responds to the command, Hey Porsche! But like other recent VW Group voice setups we've tried, it's nothing like as intuitive as the latest Mercedes and BMW systems, tending to get confused between cabin feature and navigational instructions. Yesterday, I asked it for a radio station and it responded by directing me to the nearest Tesco Express store. Anyway, talking of route guidance, there's a very good built-in online navigation plus system with real-time traffic information and a charging planner that allows you to factor in battery replenishment stops. This GPS setup also interacts with voice control in what Porsche calls a multimodal manner. Simply tap the part of the screen map that you want to go to and say, take me there, and it will. 
Not so good is the way the smartphone mirroring element of this central display works only with Apple CarPlay, not with Android Auto. It's also worth mentioning that Apple Music is seamlessly integrated into this PCM setup, allowing you to stream over 60 million songs ad-free. This PCM monitor's rather cluttered home screen has lots of complicated little tiles, most of which will be quite infrequently used, apart perhaps from access to charging functions. And if you don't want to use the separated haptic black panel buttons below the vents, there's a different way into the climate system with its diffused, focused and individual modes. Uh, other tile features though fall more into the nice to have category, covering areas like weather, news and an e-manual. Plus there's a function on demand option that allows you to buy further individual PCM elements from the online Porsche Connect store that will be installed as over the air updates. Most of the time though you're going to be ignoring all of that and having this centre monitor set into one of its car screen menus. Uh, possibly those for assistance, trip or comfort, but more likely the drive one which shows your current drive mode, chassis suspension setting, air suspension height, brake recuperation level and, if fitted, the status of the electric sport sound actuator. What else? Well, as usual on a Porsche, the driving position's brilliant and personally I'd feel that my Taycan would be incomplete without this evocative DTM style Alcantara trimmed sports steering wheel. The seats are superbly supportive, especially the 18 way adjustable adaptive sports chairs in this top Turbo S variant with their electrical side bolsters. That top model features the leather free interior package that we've got here, which Porsche has decided eco minded customers for this flagship variant will prefer. Folk will no doubt appreciate the Econil recycled fibre flooring texture, which is apparently made out of old fishing nets. If you do like the thought of hide upholstery, it can come tanned by olives in a special club interior olea finish and you can extend it onto the dash and the doors. Of more importance in a GT sports car is all round visibility so you'll be pleased to find that the view forward over the low slung bonnet is almost faultless. Unfortunately though your view rearwards isn't thanks to the small rear window and the thick C pillars. All round parking sensors are of course standard but for total peace of mind when reversing, I reckon you're going to want the extra cost rear view camera too. The quality of material fit and finish from the German Zuffenhausen factory initially seems unimpeachable. Uh, predictably, it's in a different league from anything you could have in a Tesla Model S. Though on this particular test car, we were surprised to find the Sport Chrono dash clock rattling over bumpy surfaces. Provision for oddment storage around the cabin isn't particularly generous, but there's a ticket clip on the driver's sun visor and the door bins and the glove box are both of a decent size. Talking of storage, an overhead sunglasses compartment has been forgotten, which is strange on what's supposed to be a Gran Turismo style model. And this big open area under the angled lower part of this centre stack can't actually be used for anything unless you pay more for the optional storage pack that adds a stowage tray down here. Uh, there are various ergonomic design curiosities too. Uh, we're surprised that the designers didn't think to cover these central cup holders. This part of the lower console would look much classier with the kind of smart lidded finish you get on a rival Mercedes. And as usual on a Porsche, the switch for the heated steering wheel would be almost impossible to find unless someone told you where it was at the bottom of the wheels in a lower spoke. But if you're captivated by all of this cabin's futuristic screen technology, none of this will really matter. A high-tech ambience you're probably going to want to add to with the optional front passenger display that we referenced earlier. It's absent in this particular car, but if budget permits, it is probably worth having because it allows the person sitting next to you to access infotainment functions and maybe set a navigation destination for you on an extra 10.9 inch touchscreen panel here above the glove box. 
Right, time to take a look in the rear. Now, earlier we referenced the design difficulties inherent in not creating an electric vehicle of this kind as an SUV. How in an ordinary sedan body shape do you avoid the high stance that usually results from perching the passenger cabin on top of a whole bank of batteries? The kind of stance this Taycan just doesn't have. How have the designers managed it? Very cleverly, the rear footwells here might look conventional, but they're actually hollowed out sections of the floor plan. Porsche calls them foot garages that allow your feet to be positioned at the same lower height as the battery pack, rather than being placed on top of it. No other EV design team has previously thought of doing this. So you sit comfortably, though not in the kind of spacious surroundings you'd enjoy in a rival Tesla Model S, or indeed in the kind of conventionally engined boardroom level luxury saloon that Taycan Money would alternatively buy you. A nice touch is the way that the driver has an option on the PCM screen up front to remotely power the front passenger seat forward to give a rear occupant behind extra legroom. As you can see, this particular test car is specified in four seat form with just two separate seats back here. But alternatively, Porsche offers a four plus one rear seating setup that gives you a small extra middle seat. Very small, actually. Um, it'd only really be suitable for a child. If you don't have it, there's this rather useless shallow tray between the seats instead. For a GT-style sports saloon, headroom is actually pretty good, and surprisingly, it actually improves by a few inches if you opt for the extra-cost panoramic glass roof. This centre tunnel is particularly high, another reason why you might not want that centre seat, but it does at least give this two-seat layout a cocooned, uh, sports car-like feel. If you're going to be frequently using these rear pews, you're going to want to take up Porsche's offer of an extra cost uh, 5.9-inch rear passenger central touchscreen display. Yes, yet another screen, uh, though it doesn't uh, do much other than offer various climate functions, including the seat heating that the two turbo variants get back here as standard. When specified, it sits below these twin central vents. There are some things we're a little disappointed by, the tiny door bins, the lack of seat back pockets, and the way that the cup holders in this fold out armrest aren't properly covered. But there are also some lovely touches, the Alcantara rear parcel shelf, the beautifully integrated Bose or Burmester door speakers, the extra coat hooks on the B pillars, the vents in the footwells, and the illuminated door sill inlays. Right, let's finish with a look at boot space, starting not at the boot, but here at the frunk. Yes, like a 911, you get a little storage space beneath the bonnet, and it is little, just 84 litres in capacity. So anything of any size will have to be stored in the rear cargo area, accessed via this power-operated boot lid, which rises to reveal a 366 litre space. That's 37 litres less than you get in Porsche's Panamera 4E hybrid model. Though in this case, you'll probably find it's quite substantially accounted for by this charging lead case. With this in place, we struggled to get one large suitcase in the other day without altering the angle of the rear seat backs. But you might be able to leave the charging case in the garage, given that whatever main lead that you most regularly use can be stored in this compartment beneath the floor. Smaller carry-on cases fit better if this boot area is completely clear. Up to six will apparently fit, though that's way off the 11 you could cram into a rival Tesla Model S. Still, all most owners will probably care about is that this area will be amply large enough for either a buggy or, more likely, a set of golf clubs. This cargo area, accessed via this impractical brushed stainless steel loading lip inlay, has two LED overhead lights, deep storage wells on both sides, and a 12 volt socket on the right. Rather meanly, you have to pay extra for a bag hook. 
if you specify that four plus one rear seating pack I mentioned earlier, you'll also get a more versatile 40-20-40 rear seat back split that will enable you to slide longer items into the cabin without disturbing a couple of rear seated folk. Uh, the conventional rear seating arrangement only leaves you with this 60-40 seat back split. From the introduction of this car, Porsche offered three Taycan model choices. Customer options kicking off with the Taycan 4S, offering 530 PS and which, from launch, was priced at around £83,500. Remember that with that base variant, you'll be limited to a smaller 79.2 kilowatt hour battery, unless, as you should, you pay extra for the larger 93 kilowatt hour performance battery plus pack you'd ideally want in this car. From the start of production, Porsche also produced a rear-driven Taycan model for the Chinese market, which with the 93 kilowatt hour battery offered 476 PS. But at the time of this test in autumn 2020, no decision had yet been made as to whether that variant would be ever sold in Europe. The 93 kilowatt hour performance battery plus pack is standard in the two top versions in the range, which also, of course, are four-wheel driven. Rather strangely, given that this is an electric car without an engine, Porsche has retained its turbo badging for these, the mid-range turbo version with 680 PS, which from launch cost around £116,000, and this top turbo S with 761 PS, which from launch cost around £139,000. You're going to want some kind of perspective on these figures, so I'll try and give it to you, starting with where this car sits in Porsche's own model range. Perhaps the most obvious comparison to make in one of the Zuffenhausen brand showrooms is with the Panamera, which in the petrol-electric Panamera 4E Hybrid 560 PS form, a potential Taycan customer would be most likely to consider, costs almost the same as the Taycan 4S with 530 PS. There's further Panamera parity if you're looking at this top Taycan Turbo S variant with 761 PS, which is priced within a thousand pounds or so of a Panamera Turbo S E hybrid with 700 PS. Now let's broaden the scope and look at other brands. The most obvious competitor here is Audi, not least because its two contenders in this category share a lot of the same engineering as this Taycan, though deliver it in a more Vosprung de Technic style package. If you're looking at the base Taycan 4S and you've added in that larger 93 kilowatt hour performance battery plus pack, you'll find yourself paying almost exactly the same amount, almost £90,000, that Audi asks for its e-tron S Sportback. Taking on the two Taycan Turbo variants are Audi's e-tron GT and RS e-tron GT models, which, as you'd expect, will save you a little over Porsche pricing. The other key up-to-the-minute rival here is the Mercedes Vision EQS, but that car doesn't have the firepower to take on either of the two Taycan Turbo models. It's 475 PS output, putting it into direct competition instead with a Taycan 4S. That Mercedes will take you further on a single charge than that Porsche, but it won't offer anything like the level of driving involvement whilst doing it. It depends what you want. A more familiar alternative is found in Tesla's Model S, which in its base long range plus and mid range performance versions cost, at the time of this test, either around £75,000 or around £90,000 respectively. So, in other words, these Model S variants sit either side of the base Taycan 4S, which, as we said earlier, requires a minimum £85,000 spend. For this Taycan Turbo S, the obvious Tesla alternative is the uber wild flagship Model S Plaid derivative, which, believe it or not, is even faster than this top Porsche and costs around £131,000. All the Model S variants will go much further than their Taycan equivalents on a single charge, but they couldn't keep this Porsche in sight on a twisting road. And of course, they feel nothing like as nice inside. Again, it depends what you want. 
To be honest, there's not much else EV-wise that's really comparable, unless you're a Taycan 4S customer prepared to consider a really well-equipped version of a full electric SUV, like, say, the plushest variants of Jaguar's I-Pace or the Mercedes EQC. But that's not really the same thing. Porsche also wants this car to appeal to customers who'd usually be considering more conventional combustion engine GT models. And if you're prepared to broaden your search to include a car powered by fossil fuel, there are various possible like-minded Gran Turismo style performance rivals that you could consider. A Taycan 4S customer might look at a Mercedes AMG CLS 53. Uh, around £5,000 less, or an Audi RS7, around £10,000 more, or a BMW M50i xDrive Grand Coupe, around £15,000 more. The Taycan Turbo Driver is someone who might previously have been considering a BMW M8 Competition Grand Coupe, around £5,000 more, while a Taycan Turbo S buyer, not overtly concerned about the melting polar ice caps, might also be tempted by the Mercedes-AMG GT four-door coupe, which costs about the same. But none of these cars are really quite the same as a Taycan. If you come to that conclusion and have set your heart on one of these, then your decision might be finalised by a bit of uncharacteristic generosity on Porsche's part when it comes to standard equipment. Is that what's served up here? Let's see. All Taycans come with the same single-speed transmission on the front axle with a separate two-speed transmission on the rear axle. There's also adaptive air suspension, including PASM Porsche Active Suspension Management, which adapts the damping to road conditions and the drive modes that you've chosen. There's also a sport mode for the activation of dynamic performance settings, including launch control. And there's a range mode for the activation of efficiency orientated settings. E-performance stuff includes an 11 kilowatt AC onboard charger and a 50 kilowatt DC onboard charger for use of public charging stations with a voltage of 400 volts. Your Taycan will be ready for DC charging at public charging stations with a voltage of 800 volts. But disappointingly, Mode 2 and Mode 3 charging cables cost extra. And all Taycans feature full LED auto headlights that include the PDLS Plus Porsche Dynamic Light System Plus setup that dips them automatically at night. Other common features across the range include thermally insulated glass, auto deploying door handles and the PAA Porsche Active Aerodynamics package which gives you active air intake flaps and an adaptive rear spoiler. There's auto wipers and a powered boot lid and you can add in an electric logo on the side if you want. You also get all-round park assist parking sensors and a cruise control with a speed limiter. And in case of theft, there's the PVTS Plus Porsche Vehicle Tracking System Plus tracker setup. For the cabin, there's a multifunction sports leather steering wheel and two-zone climate control that you can precondition to cool or warm the interior before you reach it. Uh, there's an active carbon fine dust filter that keeps particles, pollen and odours away and thoroughly filters fine dust from the outside air before it can enter the cabin. And all Taycans use the same 16.8 inch curved display instrument binnacle screen which offers up to five different configurable views. The central 10.9 inch infotainment screen houses the PCM Porsche communication management setup which gives you online navigation, mobile phone preparation, audio interfaces and voice control. There's also a seamlessly integrated Apple Music setup that allows you to stream up to 60 million songs ad free and access playlists to suit your driving mood. New Taycan owners get this feature free for the first six months of ownership. Not so good is the fact that the PCM setup's Porsche Connect smartphone mirroring capability serves only Apple CarPlay, not Android Auto. Talking of phone connectivity, there are also a range of downloadable bespoke apps available for this car. Now, the main one you'll be using is the Porsche Connect app, which works on both Apple and Android phones and gives you a wide variety of digital features and services, including a car control 
feature via which you'll be able to check vital data such as door locking and driving range from your handset. This Connect app is divided into three main areas. My vehicle for car specific functions, me for user specific services and navigation which allows you to find destinations of almost any kind in seconds. A covered car park rather than an open one for example if it's pouring down and you don't want to step out into the rain. There are also specific e-control sections for finding charging stations, setting charging times and preconditioning the cabin climate. Beyond Porsche Connect, there are also a range of further bespoke apps available for this car. We particularly like the Porsche Road Trip app, which helps on long distance journeys. Enough on apps. What about specification features specific to the different Taycan models? Well, let's start with the Taycan 4S, which has a powertrain differing from the more powerful models with its use of a smaller rear motor. You'd be able to recognize this variant, assuming it was running in completely standard spec by its use of the smallest wheels in the range. Mind you, they're still pretty big, 19-inch uh, aero rims. Inside of 4S, you get partial leather upholstery with heated eight-way electric comfort spec front seats, along with a sound package plus 10-speaker 150-watt DAB audio system. A typical Taycan owner, though, probably isn't going to like the thought of friends and neighbours concluding that they could only afford the base model in the range, so they're likely to want to find the extra £30,000 necessary to graduate at least as far as the mid-range turbo variant. At this level in the lineup, you're treated to larger 20-inch aero wheels fitted out with the PSCB Porsche surface-coated brake package with its bigger vented discs and white calipers and the LED headlights are of the intelligent matrix kind, which means they adapt themselves to ambient conditions and the surrounding traffic. Inside, in a Taycan Turbo, there are full leather sports seats with 14-way powered adjustment, including memory settings, and seat heating at the rear as well as at the front. There's a 14-speaker, 710-watt Bose surround sound system, and you get a stainless steel pedal set and a Racetex roof liner. Extra driving features from turbo level upwards include the PTV Plus Porsche Torque Vectoring Plus system, which includes variable drive torque distribution at the rear wheels to fire you through the bends, and incorporates an electronically controlled rear differential lock for optimized traction and steering precision. This top Turbo S variant gets more, as you'd want given its asking price. More power, of course, as we mentioned earlier, though only on overboost when you're giving it full beans and then only for a few seconds. There's so much of that though that to deal with it, uh, the Turbo S has to have a 600 amp inverter double the size of that used in the lesser two models. Taycan Cognoscenti will recognize this top variant by the carbon finish for its sport design side skirts, rear diffuser, door sill guards and lower valance inlays, plus its big 21 inch Mission E design wheel rims. These incorporate yellow calipers with ultimate stopping power, courtesy of the PCCB Porsche Ceramic Composite Brake System. The Sport Chrono package you'd have to pay extra for on the two lesser models is standard on a Turbo S, uh, including an extra Sport Plus driving mode, a GT multifunction steering wheel, a centre dash analogue and digital stopwatch, and an additional individual menu for configuration of drive settings. There's also rear axle steering, including the brand's Power Steering Plus setup for more stable cornering and tighter low-speed manoeuvring. And the oral experience is enhanced by a Porsche Electric Sport Sound feature. Inside, in a Turbo S, you get a two-tone leather-free interior with embossed upholstery and 18-way adjustable adaptive sports seats at the front. There's a matte carbon interior trim package, dark silver dash accents and a race text finish for the steering wheel. Okay, so that's covered standard stuff across the Taycan range. Whichever model you have in mind though, you'll want to go further. Porsche customers always do. So let's now take a look at options. If you're choosing the Taycan 4S, there's one extra which say you absolutely have to have. 
the need, as mentioned earlier, to replace the smaller 79.2 kilowatt hour battery pack, which, as we said, is all you get as standard with this base variant, and specify instead the larger 93 kilowatt hour performance battery plus package that all other Taycan models feature. That'll cost an extra £4,600 or so, but it's an important additional spend to make. Range capability is already limited in this Porsche compared to obvious rivals, and you don't want to make things worse. In the cabin, a key issue is whether you'll want the optional 4 plus 1 seating layout rather than the two individual rear seats that come as standard. The 4 plus 1 setup adds an extra child oriented centre pew and also means the rear seat backs fold with a more versatile 40 20 40 split. Cabin screen provision is another important thing to think about. Will you want, for example, the extra 10.9 inch screen that Porsche can supply ahead of the front seat passenger? It'll allow that person to separately access infotainment functions and do useful things for the driver, like uh, set a navigation destination, for example. If you opt for the optional four-zone advanced climate control system, you'll also get an extra 5.9-inch screen for the rear passenger compartment, which will enable them to alter climate functions. You're probably going to want to think about upgrading the audio setup too. On a Taycan 4S, that'll mean replacing the standard, rather feeble, 150-watt 10-speaker setup with the 710-watt Bose surround sound system we have here. On a Turbo or a Turbo S, it'll mean upgrading to the bespoke 1,455-watt 21-speaker Burmester 3D high-end surround sound system. As for driving stuff, well, most Taycan 4S and Turbo customers opt for that optional Sport Chrono package we mentioned earlier with its extra drive configurability, Sport Plus mode and central stopwatch, the face of which can be alternatively finished in either white or red. If you want to go further, well, on a 4S, we'd want to add the PTV Plus Porsche Torque Vectoring Plus system for extra cornering bite. All Taycans would benefit from the version of the optional PDCC Porsche Dynamic Chassis Control Package which gives you active roll stabilisation with active electromechanical anti-roll bars at the front and rear axles which massively reduces body roll through the corners. Here we've been trying the rear axle steering including Power Steering Plus Package which is optional on the 4S and the Turbo and gives extra cornering stability, a tighter turning circle and easier parking. On the subject of parking, there's an optional Park Assist system with integrated surround view camera package. Now I also need to make a few comments about autonomous driving aids. Adaptive cruise control has no business being an extra cost item on a car of this price, especially not at nearly £1,300 more. With this particular test model, a step further than that has been taken, with the further inclusion of the optional intelligent Porsche InnoDrive system as part of the adaptive cruise control setup. With the aid of navigation data and information supplied by radar and video sensors, InnoDrive can determine speed limits and topographical road features around two miles before you reach them, assuming you've set a navigation destination, of course, and will modify your Taycan speed and gear shift strategy accordingly. Plus, it'll give you some extra camera safety features, which we'll come to in a moment. There are two kinds of brake upgrade. On a 4S variant, you might want to add the PSCB Porsche Surface Coated Brake System with its white calipers. Uh, we mentioned that earlier. On the Turbo variant, you could add the fearsomely expensive PCCB Porsche Ceramic Composite Brake Discs fitted to this Turbo S with their yellow calipers. Though you'd only really do that if you were planning to use your Taycan for track work, which you probably won't be because in our experience, you'll only get around 15 full chat laps out of this car on a typical circuit before the battery needs recharging. On the 4S and the Turbo, you're probably going to want to consider the optional Porsche Electric Sport Sound feature too, which adds in a more emotional, but to our ears rather boomy, drive sound. It's not for us, so we'd suggest you try before you buy there. 
Uh, you might also want the optional head-up display and the optional infrared night view assist feature that we've been trying here with a range of up to 300 meters ahead to aid nighttime vision. But personally, I think that sort of setup is more of a distraction than a safety aid. What about luxury feature options? A panoramic fixed glass roof, perhaps? Or maybe a cabin air ionizer, a steering wheel heating, or an ambient lighting feature that can bathe the interior in different colors at night. A laminated glass can be acoustically insulated. You can have rear privacy glass, and the windscreen can be specified with a gray top tint. You can add power folding mirrors, an auto dimming interior and exterior mirrors. And on the 4S, you can add uh, the matrix LED headlights as well. What about aesthetics? Bear in mind that unless you want your Taycan in either of the two solid standard colours, white or black, you'll need to be paying your dealer for one of the various available extra cost metallic shades. We've got jet black metallic here. Plus, if you're happy to double your paint spend, there's a range of four further special colours. You'll want to look at wheel choices too. There's a range of alternative 19, 20 and 21 inch rims. We've got 21 inch Mission E design wheels here. Uh, you can also get your wheel rim of choice finished in a different colour, either to match your chosen exterior colour or you can have the rims in either jet black, high gloss black, satin aurum or the satin platinum finish that we have here. And on a 4S or a turbo, you can add colour to the Porsche colour crest on the wheel centres. On the 4S, you can have sport design packages in body colour, carbon or high gloss black, or add in specific elements of that package for the front apron and the side skirts. The model designation badge can be alternatively finished as here in black, or alternatively in either silver, red or a shade that Porsche calls Aurum or you can delete the badge work altogether. The rear light strip can have the Porsche logo in blue or black, and the side window trims can be finished in high gloss black. Have fun on the Porsche configurator, trying different styles to find the one you like. And for the inside, uh, Porsche logo LED door courtesy lights might be nice. And if you don't want the Sport Chrono package mentioned earlier, you can instead fill that centre dash space where the stopwatch for that pack would be with a rather classy Porsche analogue clock. If you don't want the seat belts in the usual black, they can be finished in slate grey, as here, or alternatively in either red, blue, blackberry, various shades of brown and beige, and a shade Porsche calls crayon. A leather finish can be added to the vehicle key pouch, the sun visors and the vehicle documentation folder. And you can add the Porsche crest to the front and rear headrests and the centre console storage compartment. The brand has developed a new interior trimming material called Racetex, a high quality microfiber material partially consisting of recycled polyester fibers, the production of which has 80% less CO2 than traditional materials. You can add this Racetex finish to the steering wheel and the roof liner and also have it edging the various floor mats. Alternatively, there are various trimming packages that will finish various parts of the interior with either carbon fibre or aluminium. We mentioned the standard e-performance charge related features earlier, but inevitably more spend is going to be required here. Obviously, with the addition of a charging wall box to your garage, if you don't already have one, which can be embellished with a bespoke Porsche charging dock. Porsche can also sell you a freestanding compact charging pedestal. For charging when you're out and about, bear in mind that if you're replenishing the battery at an ordinary 400 volt charging station, the car will only power up at a charging peak of 50 kilowatts, unless you specify an onboard booster that increases that to 150 kWh, which rather meanly Porsche wants around 300 pounds more for. If you've access to a three-phase charging power supply, you might also want to consider the optional 22 kilowatt onboard AC charger that will increase maximum charging power with AC current with a consequent reduction in charging time. 
you'll additionally need to pay extra for the electric charging port covers that we have here. You can also specify a home energy manager package that can prevent your household power supply from being overloaded during the charging process and enable cost optimised charging at low rate tariffs. On to practical stuff. Well, there are floor mats of the standard or deep pile variety. And you might want the interior storage package, which gives you a stowage tray below the ascending centre console up front, plus a storage tray on the rear transmission tunnel for backseat folk, along with a net and a bag hook in the boot. Ah oh yes, the boot. For that area, you can add a luggage compartment liner, a reversible load space mat, a luggage compartment box, a cool bag and a ski bag. We'd also want to maximise the cargo area space with Porsche's bespoke luggage set. For the cabin, there's a smoker's package if you haven't kicked the habit. Uh, you can add in a fire extinguisher and guard against punctures by adding in a tyre sealing compound. For the roof, you can add in the roof transport system roof bars, which will enable you to add carriers for roof boxes, bicycles, skis and snowboards. There are also indoor and outdoor car covers available. Enough with options. On to safety. A collision and brake assist system alerts the driver both audibly and visually when it detects possible collisions with other cars or pedestrians, activating an emergency stop function when necessary. There's also lane keeping assist which warns you if you inadvertently cross lane delineating lines and traffic sign recognition which pictures speed signs and displays them on the dash. For driver and front passenger there are full-sized airbags, knee bags and side bags plus curtain airbags along the entire roof frame and on the side windows from A pillar to C pillar. There's PTM Porsche Traction Management Traction Control uh, PSM, Porsche Stability Management with ABS braking and integrated Porsche 4D chassis control. A multi-collision brake feature will automatically apply the brakes after you've hit something so that you're less likely to go on and hit something else. And there's a rollover detection system for activation of the curtain airbags and the seatbelt pretensioners. Other passive safety features include TPM tyre pressure monitoring, an active bonnet and Isofix child seat mountings. Want more? Well, rear compartment side airbags are optional, as is a lane change assist system, basically a blind spot monitor that alerts you if you're about to dangerously pull out when there's a vehicle in your blind spot. If you want to go further, you'll need to have specified the Porsche Inner Drive Autonomous Driving System that we mentioned earlier. As part of this package, your Taycan will also come with three extra camera safety features. Active lane keeping keeps you within the centre of your chosen lane, applying subtle steering torque to do so. Traffic Jam Assist uses the same tech at lower speeds so that in stop-start urban queues the car can virtually drive for you. And Intersection Assist can warn the driver, either audibly or with a jolt of the brakes, if crossing or oncoming road users have been overlooked at an intersection. You can understand how the 800 volt power supply system in use here would have benefited Porsche's 919 Hybrid World Endurance Championship racing car. It made the hybrid system's batteries recharge themselves quicker and the higher voltage meant the engineers could drop the capacity of the current circulating around the powertrain which in turn enabled them to fit thinner cables which meant a useful saving in weight. It's less easy to see the benefit of the 800 volt system here. It certainly doesn't make this car go any further on a single charge, which is disappointing as this is the one area, the one crucial area you might think, in which this car loses out to its luxury EV rivals, and particularly to Tesla badged ones. In this car's home German market, where the public charging infrastructure is relatively well advanced, you could to some extent argue that this might not matter much. 
there on just about any continental intercity journey you're likely to attempt you'll be able to find high output rapid chargers able to replenish your Tycan's lithium ion cells in not much longer than the time it'll take you to down a cafe au lait and a plate of strudel particularly if the charger in question is one of the gutsiest 800 volt ionity ones able to sustain 270 kilowatt charging uh, access to which is the main raison d'etre of this car's expensive 800 volt onboard power source tech. When public chargers like that are commonplace, this Porsche will enjoy a significant cabled up advantage over the kind of older tech 400 volt setup that at the time of this test in autumn 2020, all of its luxury EV rivals still featured. Doubling the voltage power supply and charging at 270 kilowatts allows the 73 kilowatt hour battery that most Tycans use to receive as much as 62 miles of range in as little as five minutes, or go from five to 80% charged up capacity in just 22 and a half minutes. Even Tesla's supercharging stations can't match that. But the problem is, of course, that 800 volt ion T public charging stations are rarer than hen's teeth. Apparently, over 400 new ones are opened across Europe each year, but not many of those seem to have appeared here in Blighty. At the time of this test, there were only two. Not even every Porsche centre in this country has one. The dealers call it Porsche turbocharging, though your nearest one might have sorted that issue and got itself wired up by the time you view this film. Even if you did find an Ionity or Porsche turbocharging 800 volt charger, you wouldn't be able to cable up to it unless at point of purchase you'd paid the extra £294 that the brand rather meanly charges for an onboard booster that allows you to charge at over 50 kilowatts. What it all boils down to is that your best case scenario is probably to find a 400 volt public charging station that'll allow you to charge at up to 50 kilowatts. You'll be able to find one of those and choose from several different providers via the Porsche charging service. That's part of the Porsche Connect app. And at such a 50 kilowatt DC charger, you can add in up to 62 miles of range to the 93 kilowatt hour performance battery plus pack in 28 minutes, or fill the battery from five to 80% in 93 minutes. Porsche points out rather self-evidently that 80% of actual charging on this car will usually be done via a garage wall box at home using the brand's mobile charger plus wall box or perhaps the mobile charger connect wall box which has a touch screen. Either can be attached to your garage wall with the optional Porsche charging dock or the brand will sell you a freestanding compact charging pedestal. With the 93 kilowatt hour performance battery plus pack which has 33 modules and a total of 396 cells that kind of more typical charging would take nine hours with an 11 kilowatt charger or ten and a half hours with a 9.6 kilowatt charger if you've chosen a Taycan 4S and stayed with a smaller 79.2 kilowatt hour performance battery which has 28 modules and 336 cells you can take an hour off those times if you have access to a three-phase charging power supply, or perhaps want to dig up your driveway to install it, you can reduce those times by paying extra for the optional 22 kilowatt onboard AC charger that'll increase maximum charging power with AC current. You can set charging times via a dedicated section of the PCM Center Dash infotainment screen or via an e-control section of the Porsche Connect app. And there's an optional home energy manager package that can prevent your household power supply from being overloaded during the charging process and enable cost optimized charging at low rate tariffs. So once you're charged up, just how far will you be able to go? I referenced earlier the fact that this Taycan's WLTP rated range readings were a touch disappointing by luxury EV standards. Let's get specific. I found that the most realistic figures that Porsche quotes are those for what's called long distance range, which varies between 199 and 227 miles depending on battery size, which is pretty much what we've been getting during this test. 
but industry standards are generally based on what's called combined cycle range. For this, the base 4S variant with the smaller 79.2 kilowatt hour performance battery is rated at between 208 and 254 miles, or up to 290 miles in city traffic. Specify the 4S model with the larger 93 kilowatt hour performance battery plus pack and you can increase the combined cycle figure to between 242 and 288 miles or up to 326 miles in city traffic. You'll want some perspective on this. This Taycan might be notably slippery in shape with a drag coefficient of 0.25 CD in this Turbo S form or 0.22 CD in Turbo Guys, but the fact remains that a typical large luxury crossover SUV that in contrast has the aerodynamics of a barn door can go slightly further on a single charge. You might even get slightly further in a little Renault Zoe with a battery almost half the size. Of course, it's more relevant here to compare this Porsche against the GT-style models that share this Taycan model's price point and ethos. If you're thinking of the 4S model, you'll be interested to note that an equivalently priced Audi e-tron S Sportback manages 226 miles of WLTP combined cycle range. But it's quite shocking to then go on and realise that a comparably priced Tesla Model S performance variant can almost double that to 396 miles combined. And a cheaper Model S Long Range Plus derivative does even better, rated at 405 miles combined. Having said that, you won't have your hopes set too high for the Turbo and Turbo S variants, which increase the 4S variants portly 2140 kilogram curb weight respectively by 155 and 165 kilograms. And so it proves. The Turbo has a combined range rated at 238 to 281 miles, or up to 309 miles in city driving and this Turbo S is rated at between 242 and 258 miles and up to 296 miles in city driving. Again, some perspective. A Tesla Model S Plaid, which is even faster than a Turbo S, has a quoted range of over 520 miles, a figure which must be quite painful for Porsche to hear. Remember that the Taycan figures just quoted across the lineup will only be possible if you drive with the range drive mode selected, which always starts the car in second gear, turns down the climate control, and limits top speed to 70 miles an hour. With that in place, this Porsche is mostly true to the dashboard's range predictions, which I have to say has rarely been the case with the various Tesla models I've tested. And there's a charging planner feature to help you plan your route, taking into account predicted battery charging stops. A word about brake energy regeneration, or recuperation as Porsche calls it. It's fashionable at the moment with EVs to interact with systems that allow you to vary levels of brake regeneration via steering wheel paddles, or to engage in what's called single pedal driving in which you virtually never use the brake so arresting is the regenerative decelerating effect every time you release the throttle. In a Taycan there's none of that, uh, there are no steering wheel paddles which seems odd on a Porsche and the brand disapproves of single pedal driving. Your interaction with brake recuperation is actually very limited. On that subject, there are PCM screen options of on or off. And even with the recuperation system on, the car doesn't slow that significantly when you come off the accelerator. Porsche says this is because maintaining momentum is more efficient than needlessly slowing the car in order to create a relatively small amount of electricity. What the brand has developed instead is PRM, or Porsche Recuperation Management, which you activate by selecting the Auto option in the recuperation screen. This can regenerate up to 90% of braking energy, a recuperation output of up to 265 kilowatts of energy, ready to be fed back into your Taycan's battery. No other EV can manage this to that extent. During everyday driving in this Porsche, up to a third of your driving range will be derived exclusively from recuperation. In fact, this car recuperates more energy when it's slowing down 
then is burned by a petrol powered 718 Cayman R accelerating at up to 7,000 RPM. Here's another stat. If you were to brake from 124 miles an hour right down to rest in this Taycan, you'd recover enough energy to then travel for up to two and a half miles. It's all quite astonishing. What else might you need to know? Insurance? Uh, all Taycan variants are rated at a top of the shop Group 50E. There's a wider dealer network than many rivals can offer and you'll only need to visit your local Porsche Centre every two years or every 20,000 miles. The same as for all of the brand's models, um, whichever comes first. The company doesn't offer any servicing prepayment plans, but maintenance should be less expensive than for a combustion engine model. An electric vehicle does, after all, have 20% fewer moving parts. And thanks to Porsche recuperation management and this model's very limited use of friction braking, you'll hardly ever have to replace the brake pads. The brand reckons every six years should be sufficient. All models are covered by a three-year unlimited mileage warranty package and the Taycan also has 12 years of corrosion cover and a three-year paint guarantee. When you decide to sell your car on, you'll find that this Porsche's heritage and reputation will help shore up its value. After three years and 36,000 miles, industry experts CAT reckon that a Taycan Turbo S will return 60% of its original value. Compare that with the 54% you get for a Tesla Model S Performance and the 40% you'd get for a conventionally engined V8 powered Mercedes AMG GT 63S 4Matic Plus 4 door coupe. Actually, after four years of ownership of this Taycan, you'd get more of your money back than you would after three years of driving that Mercedes. Bear in mind that depreciation will take a hit if you load your car up with too many unnecessary pricey extras. And what about the green issues? Some in the green lobby get very angry about the whole pure electric car, zero emissions ethos. They reckon that ignores the well-to-wheel demands of supplying the electricity that powers cars of this kind. We'd respond by pointing out that these people usually completely overlook the fact that CO2 figures for conventional cars fail to take into account the logistical cost of getting fuel to the pump. Still, if you're one of those enviro-conscious folk, we'll tell you that using a well-to-wheels calculation based on typical use of the UK's energy grid, the burden of filling your batteries in this car will result in a theoretical 68 grams per kilometre of CO2 being released into the atmosphere. That's certainly good, but some way from being completely green. Which is also a comment you could apply to electric vehicle engineering as a whole. Lithium-ion batteries aren't currently recyclable in the way that the fuel cells used in hydrogen-powered vehicles are. Currently, when EV vehicles are reaching the end of their lives, the batteries are being reused as energy storage buffers. After that, though, they can't simply be scrapped because lithium-ion has explosive elements. So until technology comes up with a proper eco-friendly recycling solution, which is either imminent or a long way off, depending on who you believe, these batteries are simply being buried in landfills, which is hardly sustainable in the long term for humankind but then nor is the pollution caused by combustion power. If you see the EV solution as the lesser of the two evils and you're looking for a performance orientated luxury sports saloon, we think this one has quite a call on your attention. If, like us, you'd begun to imagine that the golden age of the motor car was well behind us, there's cause for hope here, and even for an argument that a really well-engineered EV can restore to enthusiasts some of the driving involvement and excitement that's been lost in recent decades as powerful petrol engines have become sanitised by turbochargers, particulate filters and camera-driven technology. Ultimately, those petrol engines have to go, but what replaces them doesn't necessarily have to be an automotive domestic appliance. The Taycan proves that. Increasing electrification of combustion engines means the gap between the traditional petrol power plant and battery-driven powertrains has narrowed considerably. 
not only in terms of efficiency and price, but also in style of performance delivery and philosophical perception. No true driving enthusiast would have even considered an EV, however fast, until recently. But times change, rules must be reset, entrenched positions must be reconsidered. Because of this car? To a great extent, yes. Porsche makes much of the faster recharging capabilities of its 800 volt electrical system, but that's not much use to British customers saddled with an underdeveloped public charging infrastructure that for the time being anyway, will rarely enable them to get the extra benefit of this sophisticated tech. These people may wish Porsche had instead diverted more of its development budget towards the sort of battery technology that would have allowed this car to get closer to the kind of driving range between charges that you'd enjoy with a rival Tesla. But battery range is something you worry about if all you want is an electric car able to get you from one place to another. The Zuffenhausen brand has always served those who come in search of more than that. This car's exorbitantly priced, of course, ridiculously so in terms of this top Turbo S variant. Save 40% by choosing the Taycan 4S with the optional 93 kilowatt hour battery and you'd lose very little in terms of usable speed and capability, which sounds very sensible until you try a Turbo S and experience just what the world's fastest four door feels like. From an automotive standpoint, what's ultimately most important is that this car's technology and more driver-centric design will in future surely be shared with more accessible EVs in Porsche's Volkswagen Group parent company. First, premium ones like Audi's GT e-tron, then in future more accessible models that perhaps will set a fresh trend for the way an EV can drive, can charge, can make you feel. And if that happens, this will have been the car that originated it all, a landmark for the point at which automotive engineers regained emotive control in electrified vehicle development. It is exactly as its brand promised, a true Porsche for the age of electromobility. And for the right kind of customer, will be desired, loved and coveted like no other. It is quite simply an astonishing achievement.